Hi there, I'm Dre, the host and founder of The Dragon Network. On this week's video, I want to do a little bit deeper dive into the eight stages of MRAM, which is the Electronic Medical Record Adoption Model. But before I get started, if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to the channel yet, please go ahead and do that now. And as always, if you like the videos, let me know so that I can gauge what types of content to post in the future. There are eight stages to MRAM in total, ranging from stage zero to stage seven. These stages build on each other, so you can't skip a stage to achieve a stage at a higher level. The summary that I'm gonna provide is a high level overview. It is not gonna go all the way down into the exact things that you need to do with each stage, but it'll give you a good idea of what the organization needs to have in place to assess themselves at that stage. Assessments for MRAM are self-assessments from stage zero to stage five. So they send out a series of survey questionnaires that you would answer per facility in the organization. And then when you get to stage six and seven, it's a combination of surveys and on-site visits by individuals who assist you from him. Stage zero is essentially a paper-based organization and not all key areas have software in place to manage their daily operations. So before you can progress out of stage zero, you need to at minimum have the three key ancillary systems in place and assisting you. And those are lab, radiology, and pharmacy. With those three key ancillary systems in place, Stage one requires that you have them connected to a clinical data repository. And for lab data, that at least 90% of that data be available for clinicians for data trending and analysis. The 25% of the DICOM and non-DICOM images be available with that connection from the radiology system. And that those images are indexed by patient, so they can't just be indexed by modality and date they have to be grouped by patient as well. The other thing that's required before you can leave stage one and move on to stage two is that you have to have some downtime procedures that are in place for those key ancillary systems and any other systems that you may have in place already, such as that EHR if it's your clinical data repository that you're connected to. With the downtime processes, the focus in the stage is actually on communication, so letting the end users know that the system is going to be available for how long and letting them know when it comes back up. Stage two is a little bit more focused on policy and process, which is great because you do need to start layering that in as you move your way up the model. So with each of the applications that are in place in the organization, you have to have a priority scale that is identified to let you know which ones are critical. And that priority scale uses you to help inform your decisions around application security. IT change management has to be put in place, so you have to have a process by which you're going to review changes before they're put into a production environment, and all changes before they're implemented also have a clearly documented backout plan if something goes awry during the implementation process. There also needs to be some policies and procedures in place for specimen collection, for document scanning, and for blood administration. It's in this stage that the organization or the facility should look at establishing a clinical governance committee that has clinician representation to help you make decisions on your IT systems. So moving on to stage three, we start to see more robust interactions Actions with clinical information systems and more of the things we think of when we're implementing an EHR. So we have 25% of orders need to be implemented using computerized practitioner order entry or CPOE. There needs to be an EMAR in place or an electronic medication administration record and there also should be connections to external data and education materials to help support clinicians as they do their work. Reference scales, best practice guidelines and things like that need to be linked and available through the EHR for them to access to help make decisions. Your business continuity plans, you do have to have that communication in place that we established earlier. You also need to have a plan for going into downtime and a clearly documented plan for reconciling the records after the outage is over. And if it hasn't already been implemented in order to complete stage three, you need to make sure that you have role-based access control in place for all of your clinical applications. With stage four, we build on that EHR functionality. So the CPOE rate increases from 25% to 50%. We also have clinical decision support that gets layered onto that for some basic conflict checking, so drug-drug interactions, duplicate orders, things like that. 50% of the clinical documentation needs to be done online, and that means it needs to be actually entered online. It is not something that is just scanned and available online. And clinicians where appropriate and available should have access to national registries, such as immunization registries and medication databases. From a policy and procedure perspective, that clinical governance committee that we started setting up in stage two needs to have a plan to assess 
assess and review all of your order catalogs and your order sets that have been created for CPOE, and they need to assess that they're aligning with best practice and aligning with the policies that you've got in the organization. From a business continuity perspective, stage four requires that during a clinical application outage, that clinicians still have some form of access to the relevant patient allergies, relevant problems or comorbidities for their particular stay, as well as the medication lists and some lab tests. With stage five, our benchmarks for EHR use are gonna go up again. CPOE raises from 50 to 75% practitioner order entry. 25% of your medications have to be identifiable at the bedside. So this is where organizations would put bedside scanning in to confirm that the medication that's being administered is actually the medication that was ordered. And your EHR has to have some form of monitoring in place so that it can track a condition for the patient over the course of their stay or over the course of time and that it will alert you to any abnormalities, any risk factors, or anything that's sort of happening there from a clinical decision support perspective. So there needs to be alerts in place in some capacity. In stage five, the organization also has to have a secure texting program in place and some telemedicine workflows that allow for pre-admission and post-discharge activities. A health information exchange also needs to be put in place with bilateral interfacing. And to achieve stage five with that HIE, we not only have to have the ability to view information that's in there, but you also need to be able to incorporate that information into the EHR or into the record for your facility. With this stage, the Clinical Governance Committee continues to evolve their CPOE review. So they'll put more procedures in place, more policies in place to make sure that those orders and order sets are reviewed appropriately and updated on regular intervals. There are also some timing measurements that are put in place. So the facility should start to track how long it takes from an order to be entered for it to be given and how long it takes from presentation of an illness, for a lab test to go in, things like that. And some of the analytics that have been gathered sort of throughout the process of rolling out your EHR will start to inform some of your clinical outcome targets and patient satisfaction. With stage six, the organization takes that HIE information that was being ingested and makes sure it's being ingested at the discrete or coded level so that it can also trigger alerts and be incorporated into trending for the patient. And patients start to interact with your clinical information systems. So they need to have access to some of their information for review, such as discharge summaries, medication lists, educational documents. They need to be able to submit self-reported data, so whether they're following the pathways that were prescribed to them, how they're feeling on a certain day, stuff like that, something that the patient's actually going to interact with that could then be reviewed by clinicians as appropriate. In order to achieve stage six, the facilities have to have something in place to track and evaluate adverse events and never event reporting. And the governance committees that we've been building upon throughout need to now focus on clinical outcomes and patient engagement through the use of those data analytics that they've been gathering and some of the timings that they're looking at, CPOE rates and things like that. So stage seven is where we get to a point where all of that paper-based stuff is gone away and everything from a day-to-day perspective is now done online. Our clinical information systems are leveraged to improve patient safety, to improve patient satisfaction, and to make sure that we're supporting all of our clinical workflows so that we get the optimal patient outcomes. Privacy and security policy procedures are all in place for every system that we have that contains PHI and we have robust systems in place to prevent unauthorized access. So that is a brief look at what those eight stages are, again, from zero to seven. They do need to be achieved in sequential order and they do build upon each other. We do have a large number of facilities around the world that have achieved stage seven already and many, many more that are in the stage six phase, which is very exciting. MRAM is one of the first maturity models that organizations will focus on before they start layering on the others. As I mentioned in the previous maturity model overview video, which I'm gonna link to below, throughout the course of the next several months, I will do the same type of deeper dive on the other models that are there. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you again soon.